We have the, the incredible Nico House about to join us. He is in Zoom with us and I'm about to bring him on. And uh, we've already discussed Nico's amazing contribution to independent media and to seeking justice for the uh, corrupt Democratic primary. And so without further uh, delay, I'll just uh, get him into the chat with us. So one moment while I promote him. And we should see him just momentarily. Um, Nico, you're muted. Uh, you just, on the bottom left, there is a mute. There you go. Hear me? And I, I can now. Yes, I can. Great. Awesome. Awesome. What's going on? <laughs> Just a visual. I'm so glad you could join us. Thank you. Uh, Last time we were speaking, I, it was a completely, you know, less, it was a completely different subject, but I'm really glad that we're here today to support uh, Julian that you've joined us. Well, thank, thank you, you uh, so much for um, including me in this. It's something like Julian Assange is somebody that I consider like probably a hero representative of everything that we are fighting for, you know, and that we, in that people have been fighting for for so long. Um, I, I would even venture to say that before recently, you know, we knew what WikiLeaks was, but because of the mainstream media not wanting to attach WikiLeaks with the hero or martyr, we very rarely heard Julian Assange's name until recently when they decided to demonize him. And so um, I'm glad that now people have a hero and a face to match uh, with the, the same organization that has really exposed so much corruption, not only in the States, but around the world. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, they've been such, um, you know, an effective uh, journalistic outlet, as you just mentioned. And one of the really huge um, issues about about this whole um, Julian Assange vigil that we're trying to discuss with our, our audience is the issue of not only human rights, but also press freedom. And, you know, yeah. as somebody that has experienced censorship and has experienced corruption, um, you know, give the, if you could just tell our audience, like, ha what WikiLeaks means to you and what the persecution of uh, persecution of Assange means to you in terms of press freedom? Oh, man. So obviously, um, you know, I'm a journalist. And um, for, for me, journalism was at, was an accidental, uh, like, it wasn't, I, don't, I don't even know if it was a choice at this point. I, I used to tell myself, yeah, it's a choice. Now I'm thinking about it. I was kind of forced into it because people had this, this you know, undying yearn for truth in those who are willing to bring it. And and I think that there is a subconscious uh, understanding that, okay, but to have people bring that truth, you have to, that, that person has to be willing for everything that's going to come with it. Um, and that is essentially what Julian Assange embodies. And before the WikiLeaks, the recent WikiLeaks stuff dropped, um, you know, there were a lot of people in the States who had come out and was telling the stories that WikiLeaks told, I mean, revealed. Obviously, myself being one of them and a few others. Um, but for me, as you know, my story started in North Carolina while I was at UNC, uh, while I was part of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Uh, and obviously, I discovered a lot of corruption. Uh, that I, Same thing that happened to Julian Assange. I was demonized um, by people I even used to call friends. Uh, I was laughed at and uh, attacked online and threatened. Uh, but because of WikiLeaks, I ended up being uh, vindicated because there was somebody else who was willing to put his neck out on the line uh, and, and tell the truth at a time where it was highly condemned. I was publicly, I think this is the, the probably the most highly condemned WikiLeaks has ever been in the States. Um, I agree, and, definitely. You know, and seemingly, it seems like it's happening around the world now, which is so ironic, right? Because I distinctively remember when WikiLeaks and the Democrats specifically, or excuse me, when the Democrats specifically loved WikiLeaks. I like, I remember exactly. very vividly because people, I was in the military and I was actually part of an intelligence unit where they're often celebrating like, wow, I'm so glad that WikiLeaks brought attention to this. Um, I'm so wow. glad helped out. Chelsea. That's incredible. Yeah, I was in the intelligence <laughs> unit at Fort Bragg and they were, they were excited about it because there were a lot of things that we saw that, that, you know, people in the military, as we know now, were not happy was happening in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so it, so for me personally, Julian Assange is like, has like almost, it's like a, a personal connection to somebody I've never met because if it wasn't for him, I'm not exactly sure if the DNC fraud lawsuit 
would is would have been as you know as palpable as it is right now, and would have stood half the chance that it does in courts right now. Um, I don't know if I would have been personally vindicated. Um, I don't know if the the skeptical. You know, there are progressives who believe in truth telling, but they're they're very very specific because of the stigma that comes with calling out the establishment. And so I don't know if those people would have been brought over into the light if it wasn't for WikiLeaks. I completely agree. And I think that the role that they played, like the real importance of those documents in validating the experience people had in that primary is very much, um, I think, under underestimated. I think that without them, so much of 2016, um, as far as the democratic uh, corruption, never would have been exposed. Mm -hmm. Um, So from your perspective as well, like when you talk about being demonized, uh, what are some of the ways that from that perspective you feel uh, people can help Julian Assange right now as a human being and not just as the editor-in-chief of a news, uh, a journalistic organization? Oh, man, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, this for one. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. definitely. Um, obviously donating to the cause. Um, also, I would say when you write, if you, if and when you are writing to your senators and your Congress people, um, and the president, you need to appeal to the humanistic side of the situation, not just, oh, we demand, we deserve freedom of the press. He didn't do anything wrong. There is that, and that is obviously extremely true, but we know how this game goes when it comes to the United States. Um, this isn't just, it, this isn't just happening. I mean, it's happening to Julian Sines right now, and, but Kim.com is all, also has gone through and is going through it in his own way. And so exactly. it doesn't matter whether it's legal or illegal. When they want to do what they want to do, it's going to happen regardless. So you have to appeal to the humanistic side of, of these government officials. And I would even encourage posting your letters and what Julian Assange's, uh, what his efforts mean to you online um, via whatever social media or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, just so people can see the the effects that free speech in truth has and how valued it is i think that's an incredible idea and i think that's really um something that people do again need to be reminded of is how much of a difference a really tangible difference it does make uh to express support of julian to retweet or to reshare and all of that uh towards supportive accurate reporting and uh on wikileaks and julian so um we're talk- we were talking just a minute ago about the importance of WikiLeaks to your case specifically, but I know that um, you know since the 2016 election, you've definitely moved into being um, an, in- an independent journalist and somebody who's actually started you know a network with M- Mikasa Sukasa with Just mm-hmm. Inform. So, what do you think the state of that independent um, journalist, that indie media that's been really growing in the last few years, in large part thanks to WikiLeaks? Would be would be if yeah. the prosecution and the persecution of Julian Assange as a, pr- a political prisoner was successful. Like, how d- can you give some idea of how damaging that would be? I think that it would be one of the stupidest mistakes for <laughs> for this administration to make. Uh, the, I think that Trump specifically, because he's like a PR. I don't know if you want to call him a PR Zen master or he's just you know maybe he just gets lucky all the time, but. He knows when it's time to to just say, you know what, if I mess with that person, it's not going to look good on me because it isn't just the left who loves like the progressive left that love Julian Assange. But it's a large amount of the right who previously didn't like him. Right. I, so. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's why it's so important. That's why this vigil exists in the way that it does to bring that support together from all sides of the spectrum. Definitely, because exactly. it so, would be completely yeah. ineffective without that. If they prosecute him, that will be that would make him a martyr. Um, That's true. God forbid if anything happens to Julian Assange while he's in uh, what I call custody. I don't really consider that freedom. Um, if they, if anything happens to him while he's in custody, that would make him a martyr. It would galvanize the independent community in such a way that you're looking at statues erecting, you know, T-shirts being made. It would make him almost like a Che Guevara. Of, of free speech. Um, you know, it's in, Che Guevara was contra- controversial in, in, a, in a very similar way that Julian was, but the good that he contributed to in the, the, the you know, the theme of unity, despite, you know, race, ethnicity, uh, political affiliation, all of that stuff would be strong with Julian as well. So I think it would, it would just be, 
it would be stupid to I don't know why they haven't just dealt with it and pardoned him. Yeah, because exactly. Trump owes a lot of his victory to Julian. <laughs> well, that's such an interesting point, too, the fact that what they're doing to him by upping this persecution, it makes it very clear that this isn't just about a dropped uh, it, investigation in, in Sweden. This is not about skipping bail. That This is about persecuting a journalist for political reasons. This it's, is a, it's, oh, actually, it's to draw a comparison to, you know, that, that many people can understand. This is exactly what's happened to Colin Kaepernick. They're making an example out of him so that anybody, nobody else dares do the same thing again. It's like, well, it's wrong that you're doing this. It doesn't matter. And but it's interesting too, because in both cases, you have the backlash actually, as you just said, increasing the support for them way mm -hmm. more than the negative is able to affect them. Ab absolutely. Uh, if they didn't treat Julian Assange the way they did, the same are they are doing in the same way with Kaepernick. Kaepernick became the number one jersey sold that year when he started the protest and he was the first half of the year he was on the bench you know because of political stuff but he was on the bench the first half of that year and he was still the number one jersey sold it's the same thing with julian assange if you didn't treat him this way it wouldn't force people to research his complete and total authenticity and consistency in the way he applies um his his ideology which is freedom of the press period it doesn't matter if you're democrat or republican it doesn't matter if you're in america or ecuador you know, it's I'm going to expose you if there's something to be exposed. And that gets a lot of backlash. And it's I always say it's a, it's like one of those uh, it's a slow burning fire, because even right now, a lot of the truth telling journalists are dealing with. We, it, it, you're sometimes you're in a really popular side of things. And then other times you have to criticize certain things like, you know, how a lot of us feel about Q at this point. Yeah, and now exactly. we're feeling backlash from that. Even exactly. though we're, you know, models of consistency and it, but it doesn't matter because sometimes pe it makes people uncomfortable to think that they had something um, and then there's nothing there. And then they feel kind of like silly about it. So, but Julian Assange is, like I said, kind of representative of what we are dealing with, but at a larger scale, when you're on top, you're on, you know, on top of the mountain, but when you're on the bottom, it could be, it could be bad. Absolutely. And I think um, one th uh, an aspect of this, as far as Julian's human rights uh, situation uh, is concerned, what are your thoughts on this? What do, you, what do you think and feel about what's happening to him right now on a human uh, level beyond any politics, beyond any, just forgetting WikiLeaks exists for a moment, what they're doing to him as a human being? Uh, is it's infuriating. Definitely. It's infuriating. That's the, that's the only thing I can really think of uh, to describe it. It's infuriating. Um, it's infuriating. And I think because to know he was so celebrated, right? And then to pardon, well, not, well, I think what, what he didn't, Chelsea Manning didn't get pardoned, right? She got uh, her sentence commuted. So they commuted Chelsea Manning's sentence. Exactly. Who, yes. like, the reason that she was even in the situation she was in was because of WikiLeaks. And, you know, to, to claim that he is working for Russia, even though, I mean, I'm sure Russia's government has some problems with him also because he's exposed corruption on their side as well. And then at the same time, like, like I said, commute Chelsea Manning's sentence and then claim that those two things are mutually exclusive. And like they just, they, they continue to see play the American public to demonize a man who exactly. has potentially, well, I, I won't even say potentially, our world would look completely different right now in 2018 if Julian Assange did not expose what he did it would look ah oh, man there is no such thing as a North Korea deal there's no there's no conversation about peace there wouldn't be a question on whether or not we bomb Syria like we got to debate that true we got to argue that and you know Trump just got to go back and forth with his administration about that there would not there's no pushback on any of this stuff if Assange doesn't expose what he did in 2016. We don't, you know, we don't potentially, we don't know who Seth Rich is potentially. We 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 don't even realize Kim.com's story to a full extent and how related his yeah. and Julian Assange's story is. And so for a person to, to have contributed so much to freedom, which is supposed to be the principles that the United States stands for and fights for, and to see him demonized by that the same country who claims to be the flagship in those principles is disgusting. And it's like living here and in, 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 in seeing people, not every, obviously a lot of people love him, but then 
you hear people who consider themselves progressives, which I don't really, you know, classify as right or left. I just classify as people who believe in moving forward. You know, to see people say, well, he's working for Russia or he's doing. And I'm like, where did you hear that? Oh, well, this news station said it. I'm like, yeah, it's interesting. Really signed his name until very, very, very recently because they didn't want you to figure out everything that he had done for the community. It's so. incredible the lack of evidence people will accept if it comes from a figure of authority to them and that that, that still happens. But on the other side, I had another um, independent analyst in one of the stories I wrote recently um, mentioned to me that basically they thought that right now um, part of what the establishment is unable to do is to adapt to what they called the wickification of our culture and of the news. Because basically the, what they were saying, I thought it was a brilliant point, is that they've been able to, you know, uh, invent these narratives that are based on nothing but thin air for so long, for so many decades, so until Wiki comes along, WikiLeaks comes along, and the Internet Age comes along, and we're able to simply click on some information and debunk everything that they're saying to us. Yeah, pretty um, they much. They have not been able to to adapt, and that's why you see the debunking of all of the you know press narratives so I, quickly. I would say World War, pretty much World War, maybe some of World War One, but really World War Two on. They were able to, they and not were able to, because the only way they can get away with a lot of the stuff that they did was to literally lie. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to distort the truth. It was like, hey, Iran's president is now an Islamic extremist and a communist at the same time. It's like, and if you, when you go do your history, you figure out like, whoa, he was actually secular. Um, was against extremism. And then when you replaced him somehow, and this is a consistency that we see with literally almost every government that the U.S. replaces, right? How does it, every time we replace a government, a right-wing authoritarian dictator stays in there for 10 to 15 years? It's well, like, I thought we just removed a right-wing hyper-religious authoritarian dictator. So how did, why are we okay with another one then existing and we pull out of that country? And Exactly. And, which is a lie that we tell. And so you've seen this pattern and we've accepted it, right? Because we've, we've, I'm, and I am a guilty of this because I'm part of the conditioning uh, that is the United States of America. Like we are a condition. If you lived here, you would know how, how bad it really is. And I, had, I remember when I was finally started waking up to a lot of these things, it was a shock to, it, it kept me up at night for almost, you know, four or five months straight as I'm ingesting this reality because you start seeing these patterns. Yeah. Um, and then I think that the nail in the coffin was Julian Assange. It's like, hold on. When they said WikiLeaks dropped this information and I was like, OK, OK, so what's going to happen next? Are we going to address it or WikiLeaks works for Russia? Wait yeah. a minute. I was like, yeah. oh, shit, it's like I'm living in a cartoon. It's exactly. Like, this, this has to be a satire. Like <laughs> he forced their hypocrisy to show itself and they, he forced their hand. It's incredible. And as you were saying just now about these narratives that were fed to us, you know, decades ago, it takes though, it, it has in past times before WikiLeaks existed, it took decades for, for people to turn around and say, hey, wait, this history that we were fed at the time was totally inaccurate. And oh, now it's happening in real time as these narratives are being spun. And that's now, what's so dangerous. Oh, it's it, here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. I'm not sure how many people know about this, but did you hear about the recent announcement? Facebook is ending the trending section because nobody uses it. Apparently, that's why <laughs> interesting. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard before. My, they're like, I'm like, how do you use the trending section? You look at what's trending, and then stuff appears on your timeline. I don't know how you use the trending section. You just look at it. But here's what's what they're replacing it with. Well, we know people still like the news, of course, right? So we're going to give. 80 publishers, the ability to post breaking news tabs with their videos, only 80. And I said, this is really curious. I wonder who's in charge of this because this sounds kind of stupid. I don't know how to expect like, cause this isn't like a marketing move. It, 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 cause it doesn't make any sense in that regard. So I look up who's in charge of the news products in Facebook now. And it's a young lady named Alexis Hardyman. Um, do you know where Alexis used to work before she came to Facebook? She was a vice president of news products at the New York Times. The same New York Times who released the story, which is probably the biggest retraction of the century, which was the 17 intelligence agencies conversation that they started, which even after retracted, the damage had already been done. So people have still been playing onto that story. The only reason, think about this people, that story was the only reason Robert Mueller was hired, okay? 
because obviously political pressure kicked in and then uh, James Comey was allowed essentially to slide him into the picture based off of the hysteria that story created. And so this woman was a vice president of New York Times products, news products. Um, by the way, she reached vice presidency in 10 years, less than 10 years, because she worked for New York Times for 10 years. Then she ends up working at Facebook. And then her whole goal was to combat fake news. That was the reason she took the job at Facebook. And then I find out that she worked at Oliver Wyman as a, as a managing director right out of college, right out of Columbia. She was a managing director at Oliver Wyman. And their biggest client, which is no surprise at this point, is the World Bank and IMF. Interesting. Yeah, and I think um, bringing this back to Julian Assange as well, um, can, can you speak to us a little bit about, um, you know, really the importance of leaving all of our politics at the door and joining mm -hmm. this one single effort together, no matter our political differences and no yeah. matter where we come from, because, and that's the strength of what we're doing here is we're trying to give people a voice mm -hmm. on this subject that, um, you know, combines massive populations yeah. through this one issue. Yeah. And that, that was actually the point of my story. It was that they're bringing 80 publishers. Now, do you think those are going to be liberal? Only? No. You think they're going to be right wing? Right wing? Only? No. It is going to be a very controlled and concentrated list of controlled opposition on both sides. And we are going to slowly see our freedom of press denigrate because 50% of all of our news comes from Facebook right now. That's where 50% of our country, at least, goes to for the news. Do you think that that happens if Julian Assange hasn't brought million, well, at this point, billions, I would even go venture to say, of people together across the world, because it's like, look, we may have our ideological beast as far as politics is concerned, but if this is allowed to come to pass with no response, then it doesn't matter because we will be crushed. We will, like social media has become important in our ability to, to coalesce and, and, you know, and, and gather behind these issues and stay up to date and, and be aware. And if this, these thick type of things are allowed to come to pass and we don't start seeing these patterns, like I said, yeah. this woman somehow ended up at Facebook after as a, as a, at a, playing a huge part in her early thirties after working at the New York times and nobody, it wasn't even, it wasn't even breaking news. The only reason I found out about it is because tech news was reporting it. By the way, she had no tech yeah. experience, but that's part of her main, the, one of the main parts of her job. Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, the, the value of WikiLeaks too, and the reason that, that, that they are able to appeal to such audiences is because all they provide us is the truth. Model that of consistency. They don't, have, they don't have, yeah, they're consistent in that way. And so because of that, they piss off both sides, but they also appeal to people on both sides. And I would, and yeah. you know, what's funny that you say that because you, you, you know, that, um, there are a lot of people who would assume that like Jeff Sessions, for example, would be like on the side of Wikileaks. It's like, yeah, he's attacking the Dems. All right, they, they frame it as they're attacking the Dems, Wikileaks attacking Dems. But it's like, it seems like Jeff Sessions has a lot of animosity. For it's because I don't care if he has an R or a D by his name. The, yeah. the establishment network is the establishment network. Absolutely. They all voted for the war in Iraq, knowing that there was nothing there. They all voted for the war in Afghanistan, knowing that Osama bin Laden was like, I mean, and we, we, we murdered millions of people. We murdered millions of people. We don't even know why anymore. And yeah, and, I mean, and we know from, why now. And from but, a military perspective, that's so much more um, real and concrete and something that um, is really valuable for people to hear from you, I think. Yeah, um, for those of you who don't know, I'm a veteran. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah so, in, in, in the the damage that was done, not I mean the people that that were killed, yeah. But and what makes it even worse, um, and, and quite honestly pisses me off to the the upteenth degree, is that we will kill millions of innocent people. Not like yeah, they're terrorists and they know what's you know what side when when they pick up a gun, they know what happens. Like you you shot you you're shooting yeah. and you're getting shot back at. But those weren't the people we were killing. Because at that point, ISIS would be dead if we were killing millions of people, right? We're killing kids. Exactly. We're killing women who just walked out to go grocery shopping, people. And we say exactly. nothing. We, we, call them in, we call them insurgents. 
But, and, and it's funny because Cat Williams, who's a comedian, he made a joke that at the time uh, was, was funny, but I think it was like that really like nervous funny. Cause he was like, he said, it's crazy cause they'll feed you some bullshit and then, they, but they say it and they use these fancy words so that you don't have any type of emotional connection to them. He said, True. today, he, he said, today we killed, he said, the news would say something like, today we killed a group of insurgents. And he said, the average American once said, they're like, well, shit, I don't even know any insurgents. So you can go ahead and kill all them. I ain't got no insurgent friends. <laughs> and then, like, yeah, it dehumanizes. And, yeah. And then we tell them. And then we, it's, it's the same thing when we use the term, it's the, the, that's been a uh, term that's been radicalized, which is refugee and racialized refugee true. versus political prisoner, right? True, very true. I have, I live in Miami. We have a lot of Venezuelan refugees, but Venezuelans, as you know, are primarily Caucasian. And so we don't call them, we call them immigrants. Interesting. But when we're referring to the Sudanese that we've displaced, when we're referring to the Somalians that we've displaced, then we're referring to Libyans, Syrians that we've displaced, they're refugees, which so, makes, you know, which, which adds to the idea that the, the, the facts and consistency of the facts being delivered are so important on how we perceive the world. Exactly. And, I, and how, in, in, for veterans, how has the information and the evidence of war crimes that WikiLeaks has published, how does that affect, what is the significance of that for veterans who have seen this, you know, on the ground happening in real time? you know, the revelation of that publicly. I mean, I mean, look at Chelsea Manning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You, you see more and more people willing to make that sacrifice because um, when you thought you were, I, I didn't really believe in the U.S. Army. I joined for financial stability. Um, but there are a lot of people who did believe in the military. Uh, and it's it, it. There are a lot of people who suffer a lot mentally because, you know, they didn't unfortunately they didn't need actually the rev the revelations of the war crimes because they were there they were involved and they knew subconsciously what are we doing you know like why are we running into these people's houses why like well yeah they're shooting like yeah a little kid will pick up a gun and then you're like well yeah we just busted into his house aren't you like you know we got a lot of pro second amendment gun nuts in america if you step on their property, they're screaming, oh, I wish you would. We would, you know, before you even get to the door, right? We're literally walking into people's houses pretending to play hero. And, and yeah, and WikiLeaks reveals all of the hypocrisy behind that. And mm -hmm. that is absolutely incredible. So it's people suffer, people a lot. I mean, family members that I have suffer because of a lot of the things that we've done. Absolutely. So... One second, one moment. I'm looking at I'm looking wow. at the questions. And by the way, if anybody has um, questions for Nico that you would like to have us ask, please put those in the the chat, the YouTube chat, or any other social media platform, and we will be collecting those and asking Nico throughout this hour. So I'd really like to hear your questions and thoughts that we can ask him while we're here. So I'm going to yeah, switch over good. to Ecopod, see if we have anything new. Just checking. I'm going to check the chat as well. You guys are wonderful and you're talking so much. I can, there's definitely no way to catch up on this uh, amount of conversation. So yeah, as I said, if you guys have questions, let us know. Just scrolling down through right now. Lots of love hearts saying, you know, free Julian Assange, uh, keep fighting for Julian. Mm -hmm. So what was the, the was it, what, what was the first WikiLeaks publication that really caught your eye? I mean, I know that we've, we've talked about 2016. I know that, you know, that I was know, a I can't, I, every, every, I always had the feeling, well, I've always had the feeling that these terrorist organizations were created by us at the very, very bare minimum facilitated by us because, um, I, so I, I was going to actually try to uh, try out for special forces. So there's spe very specific training regimens that you use or that you practice because it's, it's you, when you're going through what's called selection, these are team building exercises that require a lot of physical concentration, obviously mental concentration, but also the ability to work together and pick up the slack uh, for your other teammates, but make sure that you also don't contribute to, you know, bringing your team down. Um, and when they started showing ISIS, I, I was like, 
wait a minute. I was, and I kept like rewinding it. I said, those are our training. That's, that's our training regiments. And they were like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, rewinding. I was showing my friend like, bro, isn't that selection like PT? And he was like, yeah, that's really weird. And it was kind of like right then and there. I knew I was like, are, are, are we paying these people? And then there were like the articles that would kind of slip out, right? Over time, over like the last, what, seven, eight years. Like saying there are a lot of Americans in ISIS. ISIS doesn't have a habit of killing X, Y, Z. Like, for example, like the black people that were captured, they like were releasing them. And it was kind Interesting. of confusing. Yeah. Cause and it was like they were showing these patterns of like, yeah, they were oppressed, like they were an oppressed group, like a rebel group. Um, and they were being retaliatory, but at the same time, they were kind of like fighting for their survival. So you have to. So if the U.S. comes up to you and says, you're going to work for us, what can you say? That's interesting. It wasn't the U.S., <laughs> but there was actually a situation that happened very recently. It was very, very much actually like that. Um, it was not in the Middle East and it wasn't the U.S. military, but it was, I believe, MI5 actually cornered somebody, I believe, on a, on a boat or a ferry. And they pr were trying to pressure him into becoming an asset. And he not only said no, but he actually recorded the conversation. And so that was posted on uh, the social media account of, um, I, I think, a political party in that area. But I thought that was an incredible example just recently of exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Cody Snod Snodgrass. Um, the, he was the one who was originally asked to do the OKC bombing. Um, and once again, really confirming everything that we had ex expect and suspected. But whenever the, the, the document that came out was, that said, where Hillary essentially was complaining because she was like, we're giving Qatar and Jordan. Yeah, that was an important Arabia, WikiLeaks document. For all sure. I saw that a lot. I was like, I was like, did she say in the same document, we're giving them all this money and they're also the largest sponsors of state terror. And, and then you go to the, the .gov website and they're like, oh, the largest sponsors of terrorism or state sponsored terrorism are, what a coincidence, Iran, Syria. Yeah. I'm like, uh, um, what was another one? It was Iran, Syria. I don't, I, all I know is Saudi Arabia was not mentioned. Yeah, uh, and, and or not Yemen. Excuse me. Um, Saudi Arabia wasn't mentioned. Uh, uh, Qatar wasn't mentioned. None of these uh, countries. From Israel. One, one question <laughs> I had for you, really specifically on that, um, not just the general releases WikiLeaks has done, but specifically on the collateral murder video. Have you ever seen that? And if you did. No. Okay, because I was going to ask how you felt watching that, but um, since you haven't seen it, basically it showed, um, you know, uh, U.S. forces um, shooting down, gunning down a journalist and among civilians that were posing no threat to them, and it was just, it was as if they were playing um, Call of Duty or something like that. It was absolutely horrendous, and that was one of the really groundbreaking um, re publications that WikiLeaks did early on, and I believe that along with the other uh, publications they did in 2010, that started basically the mobilization of an all of government attack on WikiLeaks, I mean, for, yeah, I with multiple that. agencies. And it actually, um, according to the justiceforassange.com, which is the legal website for Julian Assange that anybody can go to to get some great information on his case, basically they said that actually the FBI in 2010 started operating in England, in the UK. And we all know that the FBI is a, is a uh, you know, a national supposed to be domestic agency so you have all of yeah, these anomalous down. yeah anomalous aspects of the prosecution of assange that we are supposed to just ignore and believe that it's about skipping bail so what what are your thoughts on that on how, yeah. how ridiculous that is it, oh man i mean let's like oh like i said i know we don't want to be political but if we're going to speak strictly legal yeah legal legal is great strictly legal I was, like I said, I was, I was a, I was a legal assistant in the military. You send one encrypted document accidentally to someone, to an unsecure server, or to someone who doesn't have clearance, you're going to jail, right? And we saw what happened during the email case, and there's still not anything being done. I mean, if we really, if they, if if we were going by the letter of the law, hell, we're going by half of the letter of the law she would get life in prison. And that's, right? that's something, that yeah. In the and army, that, with no clout, that's what happens. Yeah. And that, so, that shows that hypocrisy so much where you don't see any sort of um, following the law in that sense, but then 
conversely with Assange, you see them not following the law in the sense of not, over not, only not following the law, but actually contradicting what the UN concluded, which is he exactly. didn't do anything. It's like y'all saying he exactly. hacked them, like you didn't do anything. Like, and then you know, obviously he had some of his his partners come on and say he didn't do anything. Actually, I could tell you exactly how we got documents. We met ABC here, and it was y'all people who gave you to us. <laughs> exactly. Not him. You know, like, exactly. He, he, he didn't have to hack anything. They were ready and willing because we're evil. Like our country is the people we're running it are evil. I don't know how else to put it. They're sociopaths. Um, yeah, well, actually, John Kiriaki mentioned that just before you came on, that basically the system itself, and I, and I think it's interesting to note too that, you know, in the prosecution of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, we see the banking blockade, the financial blockade in 2010, which was like an aspect of the state's attack against WikiLeaks. And mm -hmm. so what you end up, what what the, the persecution of them as a, as a journalistic organization ends up revealing the interconnection between the financial sector, the military and the unelected power structure associated with it. And, you know, and the media and all of these different aspects of this same sort of edifice. And it's really interesting to have what, uh, them show themselves in their attack against WikiLeaks. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, I would say that Julian Assange al also represents a threat of what's to come, right? So, like, not only was he, obviously, he, was a, he created a lot of problems for the establishment currently, but what happened because of that is that people were inspired. There are entire careers now that have been created um, because of Julian Assange, uh, YouTube channels inspired by it. I, I would I would probably say that mine being one of them, uh, e either directly or indirectly. H. A. Goodman, definitely, definitely, uh, you know, definitely, like a hundred percent, and he'll be the first to 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 talk about that. Um, and you in part, like the the definitely, rock, absolutely, rock that you got um, because we we all were telling the truths and now not only were we because a lot of us were talking about this stuff but it's an entirely different thing to be able to to put the facts with it, verify exactly facts. the scientific evidence and, of and these, then the people yeah. who had the suspicions were, were kind of like drawing out the patterns it's like now we're telling you we were right and so now everybody's clicking subscribe because they're like holy Absolutely. holy crap like these people are right and the news I've been watching my entire life is not only wrong, but it seems like they may be nefariously wrong. Like they were purposely lying despite having these facts. And it's, and it's not just, the, you know, the, the mainstream. We've seen a lot of uh, or a couple of big independent media conglomerates purposely ignoring facts. While I agree, trying completely. to pretend to attack the mainstream media, right? Pretending to attack the mainstream media, but then using mainstream media sources to say, uh, well, we know that, like, for instance, the Russia collusion with Trump is, is, is an absolute fact. It's like, okay, but what yeah. about all the facts? And well, why, and if you're all about justice, once again, why are you not speaking out for Assange? Exactly, completely. And I think I mean, as well. Good litmus test. Yeah. I Right, like, I agree completely. Do you think Assad is a hero? Check yes or no. If it's <laughs> yes. anything other than hell yeah, then I don't trust you. I mean, it's pretty simple. I think that that's a fantastic quote, and I hope some people live tweeting that will actually put that in a quote and tweet it out because I think that's absolutely mm -hmm. um, just very, very correct and perceptive. Um, and and you were just mentioning before about the fact that it's not a you know that that uh, distribute media has definitely been inspired and has sourced and cited WikiLeaks so many times. And something that boggles my mind, and I don't know if you've experienced this as an independent journalist, oh, is the, so is I the, wanna, I want to say something. Go too. ahead. Yeah. Hold that thought. But not only have you obviously used it as facts and as journalists, we've used it as facts, but the DNC fraud lawsuit, those documents are admissible in a court because exactly as far true. As what we know right now, um, until proven otherwise, those are not hacked the documents, even though I think that would actually be irrelevant. Um, they were not tampered with in any way because they've been verified. And so all, so now not only has Julian Assange contributed to the, you know, changing the outcome of the election, but has attributed to not even potentially because whether we win or lose the verdict doesn't really matter that much, but the exposure of the what, truth. what's to yeah. come 
Because I fully believe that we're going to have to go to the Supreme Court. And the longer we stay in court, the more that gets exposed. Well, and the thing is, too, though, um, and what you're saying is so, so, so true. And it just it, it goes to so many different subjects. That's the thing that Disobedient Media has really that has opened my eyes and boggled my mind consistently is the fact that we have used WikiLeaks as a source and as a factual um, citation for so many different topics that have nothing to do with each other that you wouldn't look at the topic itself and think, oh, that, w- that, w- that has to do with WikiLeaks. Like it isn't in the storyline of WikiLeaks. It has nothing to do with it. But WikiLeaks documents exist that help inform exactly. those stories. And that's what's it's, so I mean, important. It's- it's damn near like, you know how like people like Google, you Google this. It's like WikiLeaks is the Google of anything you want to know. Exactly. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's another live tweet right there. Exactly. And and I was curious as well, though, to hear uh, what do you want to see in the future for Julian Assange? I mean, I know we all want him to be you know free and able to speak to his loved ones. But I mean, uh, but what do you want to see and what do you think will happen? What are your thoughts on the you future I, I for mean, this? Not- Obviously, it probably wouldn't ever happen, happen. But I would like to see um, and I would like to be a part of a fundraiser um, that raises, I'm talking millions of dollars to create a WikiLeaks channel, broadcasting channel, like a broadcasting station covering the news that's, you know, we already know is on the Internet uh, for WikiLeaks because Obviously, he'll never end up on TV, but it's fine. Whatever. We don't want to be part of that anyway. But like the Internet has become so powerful. And then obviously, you know, we have just inform because, you know, to try to counteract the, the censorship we're seeing in social media. Um, but we need people, obviously, with with uh, resources and, and connections to handle the broadcasting side as well. We and RT has done a, a pretty good job of that. Um, but we I want some something a little bit more independent. Uh, even cover Assange. Uh, you're, you're saying to cover, cover Assange specifically. Cover Assange specifically. Cover the things that they leak. Because because when you have a face to match with it, and you see the sincerity, and once again you see because people are lazy, right? And sometimes it's just easier to watch videos, or else we wouldn't. Have yeah, yeah I, I've noticed that with my own articles. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you as can well. Do an article, and then somebody do a video about your article, it would get fifty thousand views, and your article would get through two thousand reads, right? So exactly, people exactly. are lazy. <laughs> <laughs> but so but I think that they also want information. They, they I think that it's hard for people who don't know, like because of the censorship that you're mentioning, it's difficult for people to know we exist if they're completely prevented from finding us. So um, exactly. that's the aim of this vigil in that sense is to make sure that we bypass all of that censorship and get this word out for Julian and If Assange. we have a professional, you know, because people, what, what it, they, they, they put trust in things that look professional, right? It's true. Like, you know, I've gotten more views since I've increased the quality of my videos from when I was just shooting with my iPhone every day, right? So if they have a setting and now all of a sudden it looks like CNN, but it says WikiLeaks, and they have consistent independent voices on both the right and the left, which we don't see enough of, um, it would be, in my opinion, it would be groundbreaking. It really would. Absolutely. I agree. And so what do you think are some, what do you think is going to happen in the near future with Assange? And I also want to know, um, you know, since we have this audience here with us, um, what are your opinions? What are your thoughts on what they should do in addition to the, because I know John Kiriak, you just mentioned letter writing to both Julian and representatives is so important. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we've, we've had all, we know that we should be donating and signing petitions and all of that, but are there any other um, activities or uh, methods in which people can affect this case? Ooh. Man, I kind of feel uh, I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, you know, they'd be watching. But let's just say uh, we, they, I feel like there should be like almost like an organized march. Yeah. Interna- internationally for Julian Assange. Um, and actually, there is one on June 19th. That will be the anniversary well, that he entered the embassy. And there's going to be a very large march on the ground um, in the UK. And they're, they're trying to be organized in a number of different countries. So thank you for bringing that up, because that is something that is... <laughs> no, really, I, I, I think it's great. It's there great to, to remind people of those of those um, events. Um, and so, yeah, so exactly. That's what, you know, and I believe, you know, People, we, sh- I mean, this is, this is the civil rights movement and Julian Assange is Martin Luther King, if you will. We need to be chained to fences. We need to have people willing to sacrifice their freedom in the way that Julian Assange has sacrificed his own. 
that is the only way that Julian Assange will eventually be free. And that's, I mean, that's really, the, that's the, the only way you, people, it's, it's, I know it's, it's difficult. I know I deal with it every day. Um, Jared and Liz, you know, people very close to me deal with what it means to, to bring truth into the light every day, having your house vandalized, being attacked, you know, having our phones tapped. I had my life threatened. Um, we've, I've had, we've had uh, plaintiffs threatened and it's, it's difficult to, to want to put yourself in that situation. But Absolutely. if, if you have kids or if you have family or you have friends, um, if, if Julian isn't successful, it could cause a ripple effect unlike you've ever seen. And not Absolutely. just in the, when, when the press can't be free, then things like Flint, Michigan happens. You know, very, very good point. Yes. You know, like I said, there is no chance for peace between Korea, South Korea and North Korea. We don't, you know, we, we, with Syria, yeah, we launched missiles at them, but it was nowhere near the wrath that was going to be felt if Trump, you know, wasn't as combative so, and, and willing to push back on that particular issue. So I'd like, like to come back to that point you just made, though, about, um, about people, this being the new civil rights movement and people being out in the streets and really protesting for Julian Assange. And that's, you know, do you have any more thoughts on that you'd like to air with us or? Um, I just feel like, like I said, I, th I feel like what's happening is very emblematic of just things that we've seen time and time. I mean, what, like Nelson Mandela, same thing in South Africa. People forget Nelson Mandela was demonized. It's the same thing like with, with Muhammad Ali. I mean, obviously Martin Luther King is celebrated, but his story is, that's told in, you know, in our general education is, a, is like half lie. Half of exactly. a lie. Exactly. Oh, he was just so peaceful and passive and let people beat the hell out of him and stayed in jail and let dogs bite him. And that's how civil rights were achieved. It was like, no, he was in the highways pissing people off, right? <laughs> Muhammad Ali, they always, they, oh yeah, he was a civil rights activist and he was a great boxer. Oh, no, 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 no. Not only was he a civil rights activist and a great boxer, but he was actively speaking out against imperialism. Oh, against America. Yeah. Imperial. Well, and that's what we see over and over again. These, um, these, you know, huge, you know, narrative changers who really speak out for truth against that establishment. They end up having, if they can't be silenced and if they can't, you know, completely erase the history completely, then they get sanitized. And Susie Dawson actually mentioned that in her article about being Julian Assange is that these people, like you're saying, like Martin Luther King, exactly, I think is the quote she used to talk about the fact that these histories are sanitized and, and made there safe for the establishment in, in that way. World, the first person that every journalist in any J school across the world will learn about Julian Assange. Because yeah. whether you agree with him or disagree with him, freedom of the press is the most important thing to making sure that the issues that either side of the political fence deals with are dealt with and, and you know, people are made aware of them. So um, that, is, that is civil rights. We don't have a civil rights movement without freedom of the press, and it's essentially, right? Um, so, yeah. I completely agree. And I think that without the information that WikiLeaks publishes, there's no way to address that, um, you know, that singular entity that we're all up against. And again, like, and I, I know I'm repeating myself, but in coming back to the whole reason that we're doing this vigil together from different sides of the spectrum is also because it's, it's the only way to reflect and to actively push against a system which is united against all of us equally. So yeah. they don't just attack uh, Republicans or Democrats, they are attacking all of us through their persecution, persecution of Assange and WikiLeaks and in an, a million, a uh, huge constellation of other ways. But so that's why this uh, vigil is important in order to bring and, everyone together. In and a I also want to make a point um, because people, they do tend to, to idolize and worship political figures, right? And, and celebrities, political figures, everything. And I idolize Julian Assange, but it isn't, and, and I think a lot of us do, but it, I don't think it's for the same reason that someone would idolize a Trump or a Bernie Sanders or a Hillary Clinton, right? They idolize them because of what they think they are going to achieve or what they perceive them have or perceive them representing. But I don't, it's not a perception of what Julian Assange, you know, is about. It's not like what we think. It's like, no, his whole thing is, I don't really care who you are, where you're from, what country you're from, what government you're from. We're freedom of the press, period. Exposing corruption, period. Exposing, Absolutely. And he 
prove that, right? He exposed the right. And it was, yay! <laughs> From the left, right? Yeah, exactly. And then when he exposed the left, it was a huge uproar because we all know that like in, at least in our country i can't speak for every country but i know in our country the neoliberals are merely controlled opposition they are conservative okay i don't want to yeah, make any that's that well that's that. that unity the unity of that structure um yeah it, it doesn't the 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 political parties and political parties in that sense um mm. are not different and that's exactly what's and so when the neoliberals get because it's one thing when the right gets exposed it's like okay whatever they were already disliked heavily when they were getting exposed anyway right but whenever the Obamas of the pretty smiles that hide behind, you know, that are the drones that hide behind pretty smiles, right? When the yeah, Hillary incredible. Clintons of the world, because, you know, Hillary Clinton and her involvement or the foundation's involvement with so, many, so much international corruption that it didn't matter if you were on the right or the left, everybody mutually benefited from it. When, sure. when those sure. things start getting exposed, because those are the, they have those behind pretty faces and nice words and feel good stories. Well, and one thing, Also, John everybody starts fighting. I that that goes to a point John Kiriaki made um, just just recently, and that well when he was on our show. Oh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Don't mind me. Continue on your your thought. And we have five minutes left in this segment. Are yeah. there any uh, more thoughts you want to share about what WikiLeaks means to you, what Julian Assange means to you, and you know anything else? Um, on that front? So, you know, as you know, we started uh, just in form with myself and then Tim Black and, and Suzanne Murphy, uh, and. The reason that it really all started was because Suzanne found me whenever I first, first exposed everything in North Carolina. Nobody knew the hell I was, and half of the people who knew who I was thought I was crazy. Um, and the only reason Suzanne had so much faith in me was because of the, 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 con the integrity that's in the behavior that I, I emulated you know, from Julian Sanders. I didn't even know he was representative of at that time, right? Yeah. It was, I was calling out corruption. And then when I had to make that decision that I feel like almost every journalist in their career has to make at some point, it's like, okay, if you're going to call out corruption here, are you going to call it out when it could mean that you're not going to be supported anymore? You know? Exactly. That is a and, huge, a huge issue. Definitely. And I did. Um, and it was this, and it, the the same, the premises and the logical the analysis was the same. It's like, look, if we're going to do this and, cons and and hold these people accountable for this, we have to do that on the other side of the fence, or else we're just going to end up in the same position. And so that consistency is almost like it became a template for her, and then for myself, and then for Tim, and then for you, and then Caitlin Johnstone. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and, it's and it it became at that point so much easier for all of us to see where anybody's uh, uh, where their goals are, right? What they hope to yes. achieve by practicing in journalism. Because you truth telling, it's it's when you're really doing it, it's not it's not profitable, people. It's really exactly not. Um, <laughs> that is such an important point. No, it really is because you, it it's <laughs> it's easier as you're saying. No, I think it's really important point that people understand that um, when you speak about an inconvenient topic that your audience may not agree with but you know is the truth um you're actually going against your financial interest if you're truly independent and you're not being sponsored by a big corporation and exactly. blah blah blah, blah. Or, so or um that is a difficult by yeah. like the right the right despises like not all the right obviously but a lot of the right despises if you as, as well from my experiences and experiences of my colleagues if well, I, in the last few minutes bring yeah. up you know, like race in reference to how politics or situations like freedom of the press affects it. But I bring, I talk about every aspect. It's not yeah. just racism, about racism, sexism, everything. But when I get on that, all of a sudden, everybody wants to tune out or complain. But in my mind, I'm well, not in my mind. I say it out loud. I say, look, if this is important to you, or like freedom of speech, for example, I said it about Roseanne. I said, if you are saying that Roseanne should get another chance, that we should respect her right to freedom of speech. I 100% agree with you. And guess what? You should be fighting even harder for Kaepernick because the freedom of the speech of the people that we agree with is not as important for fighting for the freedom of the speech of the people we disagree with. Because that's actually so rare. It's so rare that people actually have that understanding that free free speech should apply to absolutely everyone. And so, um, but but bringing us back to Assange, um, in the last couple of minutes, we have about two minutes left. Um, with you here with us and I would like to just any is there anything else about WikiLeaks and Assange that you'd like to sell, tell people and uh, either how to support them or just how it's impacted your life 
Well, obviously, go donate, you know. Yeah. Um, first of all. Second of all, there is no DNC fraud lawsuit without Julian Assange. It probably been would have been nipped in a you know, nipped and tucked immediately, immediately dismissed if it wasn't for Julian Assange. Um, and all the things that we know he's done for the world, and all the sacrifices that we know that he's done for the world. Uh, imagine all the things that we don't know he's done and the things that we don't know he's going through. Um, he will never be able to have the family that you have in your home right now. He will never be able to have the jobs, you know, the, 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 the nine to five, I get to go. I had the, the comfortability, you know, I get to go home or go to work, come home. My paycheck's there every day. I'm going to have dinner on. I know what I'm doing the next day. I know what I'm doing the next week. He doesn't even know if he's going to be able to live until 75 in his own home in a little college in Australia somewhere. Like that's huge people. Absolutely. I mean, consistency in, in, like, in life is very undervalued until you don't know every single day until like that people in jail, for example, like, you know, that are on trial, you don't know. Yeah. It's pretty much like us in jail on awaiting a trial that should never have even existed every single day. He doesn't know if one day he may be victim of a false flag, you know, yeah. like, Oh God, what a well, surprise. The Ecuadorian embassy just blew up somehow, which yeah. never has happened ever in history. But this time it happened to be where Julian Assange was like, he doesn't know. And he's not stupid. What we know, he knows infinitely more about. It's got to be scary. And that uncertainty is even worse now. Yeah, because he's because he's been silenced. So just think about that. If you ever considered like just being inactive and and, and cheering from the sidelines, I urge you to think about how how you would be affected by that situation. Um, And, you know, and wishing that people would be active in the fight for Julian Assange instead of cheering from the sidelines. Thank you so much. I, I think those sentiments are absolutely completely uh, perceptive, important, and I hope that our viewers really take them to heart. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. I'm so glad you agreed to participate in this vigil. And um, oh, no, that was my pleasure. Thank you. And thank you so yeah. Much. And and if um, can you throw people um, you, where they can reach you on social media and all of that and and um, please also remember everyone as we break or as we go into our next segment um, please remember to go to um, iamwikileaks.org and donate and justice for Assange and donate to his legal defense fund but if you'll just leave us with um, where yeah. people can find you <clears throat> so if you want to go find me on Twitter it's at Nico N I K O C S F B C is in cat S is in Sam F is in frog B as in boy, so Nico C S F B. My name is spelled N I K O, not N I C O. So <laughs> no, you're um, actually your name is one letter off from my mother's name. That's hilarious, but yeah, uh, nice. Um, and you know, on Facebook, uh, if any of you are there still, uh, it's Nico N I K O D House. And then on YouTube, you can look up at you can type in my name Nico House or M C S C Network, as in Mikasa Sukasa, M C S C Network. Um, you can find me there as well. Uh, and and Find me on Justin Form, uh, justinform.com, which is J-U-S-T-N-F-O-R-M. You can look me up by Nico House.